Welcome to our session, Kubernetes is the control plane for the hybrid cloud. This is gonna be a more in-depth version of a similar keynote that Clayton is doing at KubeCon this year related to some work we're thinking about in the upstream Kubernetes community. We wanted to give you a bit more context and connect it more deeply to the problems we hear from customers and how OpenShift and Kubernetes are evolving to address those. My name is Joe Fernandes, and I'm the GM of the Core Cloud Platforms Business Unit here at Red Hat. And my name is Clayton Coleman. I'm architect of Hybrid Cloud at Red Hat, and I've been focused on Kubernetes and OpenShift for a very long time. Um, if you've seen some of my previous KubeCon talks, I've focused on how boring Kubernetes uh, should be, uh, needed to be, in order for us to all be successful. Um, after a pretty crazy year, I feel like this is the perfect time to talk about things that excite me. Um, Joe agreed that these are exciting ideas. Doesn't mean we're going to do them, but it means they're a way for us to think about where we want the future of our community and our project and um, how we can uh, deliver the most value for application teams and uh, operations teams at the same time, um, which is really what Kubernetes has been about from the beginning. Before we get into the details, let's just talk briefly about uh, Red Hat's Open Hybrid Cloud strategy and what's it's, what it's all about um, and how OpenShift and Kubernetes enable that. All right. So, uh, Red Hat strategy is open hybrid cloud. It's something that we've been talking about for many years. And really our focus is on two key things. First, how do we enable enterprise customers to build and manage a hybrid collection of apps and services that span from traditional architectures to cloud native, to data analytics, AI, uh, ML integrated and beyond. And then second, how do we enable those apps to run anywhere across a hybrid infrastructure spanning from the data center to multiple public clouds and out to the edge? So OpenShift is our hybrid cloud platform, and it's built on a foundation of Kubernetes and Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but provides a comprehensive platform that enables enterprise customers to build, deploy, and manage applications wherever they want. If you attended our OpenShift roadmap session at Commons Gathering or any of the other venues, you saw a lot of our recent work has been around how we add new and better capabilities for managing multiple OpenShift clusters across multiple environments. Features that we're developing to help customers manage OpenShift and their applications across a hybrid environment are the same ones that we rely on ourselves to deliver OpenShift as a managed cloud service. So as you can see from this slide, OpenShift is available as a fully managed cloud service across all the major public clouds. And then we also deliver it as a self-managed software solution that you can deploy and manage yourself wherever you want to run it. But either way, Kubernetes is at the core of this platform. Yeah, and I mean, seven years ago, we began this project, um, you know, we uh, working in the community on a broad and expansive, you know, vision for how containers could uh, help make applications teams more successful. It was a really simple idea. It's orchestration of containers, a declarative API model. Um, the API model is about intent, right? That's uh, saying what you want and then making the machines go realize it because we have other things to do. We gotta go write those apps. We gotta debug those apps. We don't wanna be there telling the machines what to do every day. That's The machines can do that for themselves. Um, we heard clearly you know, in the early phases uh, from early adopters, we needed to bring new concepts in. Like declarative APIs are really powerful. Can we bring new concepts alongside all the ones that were in Cube? And, um, that's been successful beyond our wildest dreams. Um, and today, seven years later, um, a huge number of organizations and companies and individuals run services um, successfully on top of Kubernetes in a way that it standardizes deployment. Um, and so we need to ask, you know, what, what can we do to uh, move Kubernetes forward? Talk about the uh, evolution of Kubernetes over those last seven years and, and how it's evolved to address customer needs. And this is just one way to look at it. Um, I looked at it in, in terms of these three phases. So in phase one of our Kubernetes journey, the Kubernetes API and the core primitives and declarative resource controllers that are part of that allowed users to orchestrate an expanding number of application workloads. And we saw this with customers and partners alike. Yep. And you know, this is uh, the, the evolution of Kubernetes has been driven by people putting it into use and then finding gaps and helping us identify, you know, where the project as a group we could go. So Amadeus is one of the uh, one of our earliest Kubernetes clusters. They started using uh, replication controllers for their long running services. Uh, and this is in the days before deployments. Um, they realized they also needed a solution for batch jobs. And 
at the heart of Kubernetes, we we anticipated this, but um, you know through that col community collaboration, Amadeus was actually able to help drive those features. It was, a, uh, it was the very beginning of Kube, and those features today exist as part of that um, you know collaboration in the community. Oh. And, uh, and earlier, um, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, oh. And also, like, and before I forget, like uh, Couchbase, one of our key partners, um, also wanted to deploy databases and containers. You know, this was a hugely controversial topic for the first five years of Kubernetes, um, and it was really uh, people who were willing to believe that this was a better way to standardize deployments for all their applications. Um, people who put their time in in the community to make sure that these were um, reliable and stateful sets, um, which you know, themselves have gone through a long evolution, um, are there to support workloads that need to be predictable over a long period of time. And that was through, you know, those kinds of collaborations that, that was possible. Then in the second phase, you see here in the middle, um, we needed to expand beyond the Kubernetes API, right? And so operators and, you know, custom resources, custom resource definitions, which powered those operators, allowed users to extend the Kubernetes API to manage more complex workloads uh, day two by adding customized automation that was specific to each component or each service. Yeah, and you know, early in um, the development of OpenShift, um, we made the decision in the Kubernetes community that we wanted to have a small, compact core of functionality that wasn't platform as a service, which you know, it was about running applications. And obviously the scope of applications is practically unbounded. Um, working in OpenShift, we wanted to contribute these concepts and build them in, but we had no way to do that within Kubernetes itself. And so, you know, at, over time, uh, you know, in partnership with a lot of folks um, in the community, that led to custom resource definitions and common controller logic, um, which have, you know, and now enabled and empowered a huge amount of extensibility over the years. Um, Custom resources let us put the config for the cluster on the cluster. That's something that the Kubeadmin project has used as well. So it's this this idea that everything could be extended and you bring new concepts cleanly um, really is a, a key part of Kubernetes. Um, CoreOS um, brought it up, um, kind of formalized and helped settle the pattern, which is it's not just the API and it's not just the controller, but it's the two of them together and it was called operators. Um, the operator pattern is really about hiding complexity, um, whether it's for deployment or for extending Kubernetes. Um, and you know, through the work we've done, that's been integrated back into OpenShift. Um, and um, you know, we've seen a huge uptake in the broad ecosystem of people extending Kubernetes with their concepts. Um, and we think it can go further. Yeah, so, so now in this third phase, uh, we're thinking in terms of uh, lots of applications spanning many clusters, those clusters spanning many different environments. And so really what we're trying to do now is uh, explore and we'll do that in this session. How can we better leverage that Kubernetes API to manage services across multiple clusters uh, and you know, have those clusters running across different clouds, data centers, and edge environments? Yeah, and today in a, in a sense, we're ex continuing that extension pattern. We're bringing new concepts. Um, we're doing it, you know, depending on how you approach the problem. Some folks are building this out from their cloud console projects like Arc or Anthos. Um, within Red Hat, uh, we've been actually thinking about this as what if you had a hub cluster that um, was a little bit of your management cluster for all your other clusters? What are the extensions you want to add? The ability to create new clusters, um, the ability to run integrations that ensured policy was um, synchronized across those. And so, you know, it's pretty natural for us to think of how can we add those new concepts in that make multi-cluster easy. Um, as we've started to go, we know that that's not enough, right? There's um, there's always better ways to subdivide work. And so um, some of the, the learnings from, you know, the very early days of Kubernetes, adding new concepts, concepts that we never got around to, um, going in and building operators and, um, you know, the broad ecosystem of people plugging into Kube. And then this multi-cluster idea is, we started to look at this um, and we're kind of exploring at how can we take some of those ideas and compose them in novel ways? Um, and this is this is really early. Think about this as a, um, we don't even call it, I don't call this a project. It's definitely not a product. Um, we're calling it kind of a prototype. It's a way to think about these ideas together um, that can help us look at the same problems we've been having in new and different ways. So uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes standardizes deployment. Um, 
we've kind of said, you know, what can we do to improve um, security? Uh, if you've got all these clusters all over the place, there's a lot of duplication. Um, you know, how do you look for opportunities to separate out control planes from data planes? And how can you improve resiliency, operational flexibility? If you've got to install more and more stuff into the same cluster, you run into some limits. Um, I think to a lot of people today, Kubernetes, the container orchestrator, Kubernetes, the declarative API, um, they may seem inextricably linked. I think that like, you know, this is the simplest architectural slide that Joe and I could find of, you know, all of these concepts. And there is a huge amount of detail hidden here. But you think about these pieces, most of us think, you know, these are all part of Kube, but we wanted to come into this and say, well, you know, what if we change direction? What if um, it wasn't about all these other pieces, it was about Kubernetes, the API, what would it look like without pods or services, without nodes or kubelets, without controllers or schedulers. So it's like, um, I like to call this talk, um, somebody came up with this the other day, is like uh, nodes, where we're going, we don't need nodes. So that's my, that's 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 my Doc Brown impression, uh, and that's about as good as it's gonna get. So while I start sharing, um, Joe, if you can uh, tee me up. Yeah, sure, let me just go back here. So, so while uh, Clayton is uh, sharing uh, his command line, I'm gonna show you a preview again of some really early stuff that we've been playing with around these concepts. You'll see this again during the uh, KubeCon keynote if you are able to attend that. But we figured we'd be able to go through it here a little bit more uh, slowly than behind the scenes look um, and, um, and then ask questions as we go. So um, hopefully, yes, we're seeing uh, Clayton's command line and we'll take it away, Clayton. Yeah, and uh, just to continue my, uh, my Doc Brown joke, we've gone back in time. So this is, uh, you're seeing uh, the future from the past. So just pretend like the KubeCon talk has already happened. You're getting a deep dive and I promise you, you won't miss anything. So um, what would Kubernetes look like without pods? So this is the first question. Uh, so, you know, pretty standard command line, I run it. What if the server told me it doesn't know what pods are? Oh, okay, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. What, what, what can I do without pods? So uh, I tried to boil down the list of all the resources in Kubernetes. You know, you have namespaces, so you can subdivide your work. Different teams can collaborate together on similar but not identical things. Um, you know, you have RBAC, so you can protect your resources. Uh, you know, secrets and config maps and CRDs, that lets you extend and lets you put generic data there. Um, this is uh, what we're calling a prototype of a cube-like control plane. Uh, Kubernetes API without pods, containers, nodes with extensibility, client support and tooling that works today, right? Like if you see me using kube control here, what if we didn't have to throw away all of our tools and we could just take everything we have and move forward? Well, let me stop you there. So if I understand you correctly, you're essentially talking to the Kubernetes API server with kube, kube control as you normally would, but rather than having it deploy containers to a particular cluster, you're going to use the interfaces that uh, that it that it already has in order to create uh, this notion of a hybrid cloud control plane. That's right. right. Pure pure control plane, cube focused. Um, you know, it's the heart of the API. I can create and update resources, but the only resources there are the resources that help me. There's no there's nothing that has to do with running workloads. It's just what do I need to integrate anything. Um, and, and so like this kind of comes down to is like, you know, what can we do with this, you know, to follow up on your question, Joe. So, um, you know, there's a ton of integrations actually out there today uh, that are, uh, that integrate stuff into a cube cluster, um, but that don't actually live on that cluster. So cloud resource operators, you know, I've got a couple of examples scattered in here. We actually shortened some of it so you can actually read it because everybody gets really long with their names. but um, you know, I can create buckets or topics, I can create functions. These are all features that exist today in various operators and extensions. Um, you know, sometimes you're dealing with multiple clusters and you need an integration that lets you, you know, work You know, say like, I want this cluster to expose this part and then I'll go to my other cluster and install that CRD. Um, and kind of one of these challenges is they all require you to know, you know, which one owns it. So like if I had a database and uh, it was installed on this cluster, Oh, well, I screwed up in the demo. Um, even in uh, recorded sessions, uh, demos are still un unfaithful. Uh, but that uh, that database, I would still have to know where it is. And so we kind of asked the question like, well, okay, well, a control plane could be the place where it all is. And that means that I don't have to think about which cluster to secure, is it okay to install an extension there? 
I can run the control plane, and then my clusters are separate. So, so you're basically taking all those Kubernetes primitives that we described earlier that came out of the first two phases of the project's evolution, users' roles, namespaces, controllers, and so forth, and really applying them in a different way, right? So you're now applying them to kind of manage services uh, or apply to usage that really spans clusters and you know sp spans uh, the users and the applications that run across those clusters, right? Absolutely, yeah. And it's um, it's the it's the basics of Kubernetes, but we don't think about them because we're always talking about services and pods. Um, and so I, you know, I I showed like ten examples getting installed here, and I think one of the challenges, and we see this today everywhere is I install one extension and I install another extension and I install a third extension. The more I add, the more concepts I have to keep track of. And so, um, you know, teasing apart those problems so that we're talking about them in different ways um, helps, you know, get a lot of things. So, you know, uh, if I'm a security team or I'm the, the infrastructure team, I may not want to know about higher level integrations like this. That's not my job. That's not my role. And so if we can tease those apart, what are the things that would help us tease it apart? So, um, you know, one, one real challenge uh, is multiple teams sharing a single Kubernetes cluster um, with something we've been exploring for a long time. Um, OpenShift has spent a ton of time and effort um, and, you know, adding tenancy to Kubernetes, um, keeping teams apart, uh, making stuff secure. There's a lot of different trade-offs. There's no perfect security. There's just what is right for someone at the time. And, this better or worse, you know, a single cluster, I think, is still one of the strongest boundaries we have. So, you know, if we're imagining a world where we have more clusters um, and we have that cluster as a strong boundary, it led to a real question that I think is, is super exciting, which is if instead of just having lots of clusters, if we could get make getting one more cluster really, really cheap, would we still need to have all those big, you know, physical clusters? Um, and, you know, Joe, like, you know, we talk about this all the time it's a, it's a key right. challenge customers have yeah definitely you're hiding highlighting a challenge that you know that we've been talking to customers about for years you know not just open shift customers but uh kubernetes users in general which is how do you manage tenancy across your various developers and teams right we saw this from the earliest days of OpenShift 3, um, customers would start with a single cluster, start with a small team, and then inevitably uh, that would grow. Um, and we did a lot of work around, you know, multi-tenancy within the cluster to address that, right? So, you know, if you saw where Red Hat invested our resources, it was in into uh, evolving features like namespaces and quotas and roles-based access controls. Um, and then uh, even additional concepts uh, beyond Kubernetes, things like the multi-tenant OpenShift SDN to segregate application traffic. We worked then on uh, network policies and more. So despite these capabilities, customers always found requirements uh, that you know would call for creating yet one more cluster, right? So uh, so all the tenancy in the world doesn't eliminate the need for multiple clusters. And then as the number of OpenShift clusters grew, so did the need for more multi-cluster management. And we already discussed that earlier. That's really what's driven our roadmap recently around bringing in better multi-cluster management capabilities. But it sounds like what you're talking about here is how can we make it easier to just ask Kubernetes itself to give us clusters when we want them uh, and then you know, make them available for what we need them for. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this is a little bit mind bending. And um, I think there's a lot of things that we're still exploring, but you know, there's a hard limit in Kubernetes. If you want to tease apart all your different extensions and people still need to run in that environment, um, you still have to install all the CRDs together. There's no tenancy for CRDs. So it was, it was really obvious. It was like, okay, um, we've got this control plane that's really stripped down and we're adding CRDs to it to make it something that you people can work together. So I'm going to show you here, uh, you know, I'm connected to my local control plane prototype. And um, I'm going to show, you know, as you can see, the URL that we're connected to from Cube Control. You know, it's my local server. Um, we're going to switch to a different context um, that's provided. The prototype generates a Cube config file that actually points to two different clusters. So they're called the second one user. And when you look at the config line, what you'll see is um, the URL is different. And so it's the same server, but I've got Two clusters. So there's the first cluster that I did all that, uh, you know, the showing you did that pods and I installed CRDs into. Mm -hmm. But in this second cluster, if I call get databases, um, it tells me it doesn't have any databases. And that's because the different clusters see different CRDs. 
So if I call cube control get CRDs, there are no CRDs. So in a sense, um, you know, the database from the other cluster is invisible. Um, the new tenant can't even interact with it. That's like a that's a pretty hard security boundary. So like two different teams on the same, you know, they're talking to the same server under the covers, maybe there's some stuff being shared, but to each individual team looks like two completely different clusters. So like, there's a lot of possibilities in here. Um, imagine uh, instead of one cluster with thousands of services, you know, what if we have thousands of little clusters each running one service? What are the things that we could change development wise and operations wise that, you know, starts to split that problem up? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. It, it also aligns with you know some of the work we've been doing lately around around getting smaller clusters, right? So we've seen that related to customers who want to run Kubernetes at the edge, which we've try, been trying to enable with OpenShift, whether that's in a three-node cluster configuration, a distributed worker node, or even single-node clusters. Um, we're also doing some of that work uh, with the IBM Cloud team around a project which we've called HyperShift and. Um, Hypershift is, is a project that uh, allows you to deploy Kubernetes in a managed control plane model. So what that means is you have a central management cluster, it's running control planes for a bunch of other clusters, um, and then the end user clusters are literally just the nodes that they bring uh, to, to the party, essentially. So you know the cluster could be just their one node and they get assigned a control plane. So kind of lots of interesting concepts that have been coming up lately around, you know, how do we make these clusters smaller? How do we get more of them? Um, and it's kind of interesting to think about in this context, when you try to, you know, when you're saying, let's flip uh, the view here and think about, you know, thousands of applications, <laughs> uh, thousands of services, each in their own little cluster versus, you know, uh, putting them together. Does that yeah, and it's, there's a bunch of advantages, like, you know, split control plane in your data plane, you keep all your, you know, your high level logic on the control side. So like, if you could have a control plane for applications, you know, you don't need a ton of stuff. And actually, this, I'm going to show like a couple of examples here. But, you know, if I have, you know, to even get to the point where we could do this, well, I need, you know, I want to have thousands of applications, but if I can't bring all my existing applications, um, it's going to take a while. And, you know, that would be, It'd be really painful. So like a big idea for this prototype is, you know, how can we bring as much as possible of Kubernetes forward without having to change everything? So, um, you know, what if we could connect our control plane to existing cl clusters? So you can turn Kube the API server, the lightweight control plane, um, back into Kubernetes, the orchestrator. So I've got a, uh, a little CRD here and, um, you know, it is a, uh, it's a, it's just pointer to a cluster. It's got a kube config. Uh, as well, and I got a secret in there that I'm not showing. Um, and then I'm going to apply that to the control plane. And so that's, oh, okay, that looks like one of those bugs. Okay, so uh, it applied the resource and it's created. And so now I've got this created, and I'm going to go ahead and create a second one um, because, you know, if you just have one cluster, it's not a really good demo. So we'll do two clusters, but you're going to get the same error again. Yep, so uh, it went and created the clusters. Uh, and there's still some bugs, I said it was a prototype, right? Um, so by installing this cluster, what have I done? Well, what I've done is I've imported from those clusters all of their resources as CRDs. So I didn't need to implement that that other clusters handling it. So just like we added those CRDs for external integrations, what if Cube was an external integration? So um, I'm going to, uh, you know, now that I see, you can see uh, deployments are in this list. Actually, let's scroll back up. Yep, deployments are up here. And so I have a deployment and I asked for 15 replicas and it's, you know, connecting to two local clusters. And I just run Cube Control Apply Deployment against the control plane and it goes and creates it. So if I call, you know, get deployments now, you'll see it. If I, I'm going to wait and wait and wait and wait, and this is local, it's kind of fast. So, you know, I, if I do it, I see those resources get created. So I, you know, I had a simple controller here, like that split it up, right? So we created the one and then it was like, hey, like what if instead of just, you know, um, you know, running just the deployment, what if we had a little controller on the control plane that would split them up and run them on the individual clusters? And some of this is like pretty prototypey. We're still just kind of hacking this together. But the idea would be that, you know, you define your app, you take the apps that work today, you stay on the high level details. Um, 
instead of getting down into the weeds, like, you know, uh, we want to focus on deployments and services and integrations with databases. I don't want to be dealing with this low level. It's like, we've kind of come full circle, you know, from cube to API and then back to cube. But maybe what's different this time around, this is kind of like the big idea. And that's why the prototype was so exciting to me is, you know, what if we just didn't add pods back, right? You know, what would it mean to have a cube without pods? Like we've been doing this for, you know, seven years. I've got this fully running application. It's got these other clusters out there doing the hard work. You know, maybe seven years into Kubernetes, like maybe that fourth step in the slide that Joe showed is like, maybe we should be thinking about applications, like pods, nodes, clusters, those are details. Let's think about applications, services, how I glue things out. And that, to me, that's hybrid, right? It's connecting all the different things, not just pods and nodes, but all of my application in any cloud, in any environment, on-premise, um, you know, hosted, service or not, like trying to pull that together. And I think this, um, you know, I think some of these ideas could be pretty instrumental in getting to that point. That sounds awesome. Uh, and that's how you start turning Kubernetes into a hybrid cloud control plane, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, so how can people learn more about this? Uh, you know, where, where can they go? So tomorrow when, um, and I think this this is uh, the session before, the day before KubeCon. So um, my talk at tomorrow, we're gonna, uh, we'll publish the repository and it's uh, github.com slash kcp dash dev slash kcp. And kcp is just a, this is a prototype. Um, KCP is an arbitrarily chosen acronym that has nothing to do with anything about Kubernetes or control planes. It just looks that way. Um, you know, we're we're really thinking about this as like the seed of a bunch of ideas. Um, you know, we want to see how those go. Uh, we're not too opinionated at any point here. Our got our goal really, I think, as you know, Joe said, is like we're trying to bring together these ideas and, and really move the conversation forward. So I I'm excited to be here. I hope everybody um, you know loves these concepts, you know, please reach out to us. Um, and I hope everyone here does have a great QCon and uh, please watch my much more compact talk um, now that we've given you the uh, insider's preview to it. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. And thanks for joining our session.